John le Carré's name dominates spy fiction over the last half century. His geopolitical range is extraordinary. It covers the fierce secret combat of the Cold War and its impact on the societies who fought it, as well as the Russia of Perestroika, Latin America's skirmishes with American power, the moral quandaries of drug companies in Africa, and most recently, the ethical dilemmas thrown up in a turbulent world. It's 50 years since Le Carré gave us his absorbing, compromised world of espionage in The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, with its cast of flawed and opportunist characters robed in the grandeur of the Cold War. That and the many novels that have followed have won him a global audience of devoted readers, many in countries previously behind the Iron Curtain, which once separated his best-known character Smiley in his lair at the circus from his enemy, the Soviet spy chief Kala. Le Carre hasn't been shy of commenting on real-life events either since the fall of the Berlin Wall as a vocal critic of American and British policy in the War on Terror. His latest novel, A Delicate Truth, takes us into the ethical conundrums of intelligence in a world more complex and arguably more unsettling than the divisions of superpower strife. Please welcome John Le Carre and our reader, John Shrapnel. John, give us a picture of the world in 1963 as you saw it when The Spy Who Came In From The Cold was published. Yes, I'd like to do that. Um, we were 15 years after the end of the hot war. And West Germany, for all the attractive portraits that were painted of it, was an extremely disagreeable place to live in, I found. Uh, it was necessary to forget the past as a matter of doctrine. And the West German government and the, the systems, the administration, were peppered with unredeemed Nazis, as indeed they were in East Germany. But we forget almost now that um, Konrad Adenauer's principal advisor, uh, Globke, um, had been party to drafting the Nuremberg Laws, which defined who was a Jew and who wasn't made Jews use their original Hebraic names and so on. Um, we forget that the first, the founder of West German intelligence, Reinhold Gehlen, had been Hitler's chief of intelligence on the Eastern Front. And in late 1944, when he saw which way the wind was blowing, he cut a deal with the Americans and turned over not simply his staff and himself, but his documents and these became the nucleus of the BND uh, in, in, uh, in Pulach outside Munich. The acronym for the West yeah, German the BND, Security the Service. Bundesnachrichtendienst outside Munich. So it was for a young, and I suppose you could almost say idealistic diplomat, uh, living and operating from our embassy in, in, in Bonn, um, it was sometimes a very hard ticket to swallow, if you swallow a ticket. Um, and I, I, I think I began to feel, uh, as uh, in my own life, some kind of crisis, uh, where I wondered how much we could be doing to preserve democracy um, and remain a democracy worth preserving. Uh, I became perhaps a little hysterical about that at the time. Well, hysterical or not, it was also the driving narrative force in the book, wasn't it? And that sense yes. of heat and, and anger, which always struck me when I read it during the Cold War and afterwards, of everyone being walled in, the East Germans rather literally by the, the Berlin Wall, but everyone being trapped, including the West, Western yes. intelligence services. Yes, the scale of that was extraordinary. Um, Berlin was... Um, just the capital of espionage in the Cold War. Um, the scale of number of people recruited and introduced by one way or another into, West Germ into East Germany was enormous. Um, we're talking of hundreds of agents run almost indiscriminately uh, from the CIA headquarters in West Berlin, from SIS headquarters. And these headquarters, we, we mustn't think of the intelligence world as some kind of um, wonderful little corner of our society. 
this was a complete overlay in the entire system of West Berlin, really. Uh, and every corner uh, seemed to consist of, of uh, intelligence officers looking for too few spies. <laughs> and, and uh, of course, it was a mirror image. The same thing was going on the other side. But uh, going back to um, General Galen, or Colonel Galen, finally Reinhold Galen, the director of the, uh, of the uh, West German Intelligence Service, his chief of counterintelligence, Heinz Felfer, was working for actually the Russians rather than the East Germans. Clemens, the second man in that outfit. Uh, Willy Brandt's private secretary and Eminence Gries, Gunter Guillaume, was an East German spy. And uh, when we, not with my knowledge, when Western intelligence services began digging the famous tunnel in Berlin, uh, it was betrayed by George Blake here in London uh, before the first spade went into the ground. So we're talking in retrospect of uh, an amazing world of duplicity and actually of failed activity. Well, I'd love to hear an extract from the book which reflects that so well, and it's from the beginning of the spy who came in from the cold, it sets up the story. John, read it for us. Herr Lemus, quick. Lemus stepped to the observation window. A man, Herr Lemus, the young policeman whispered, with a bicycle. Lemus picked up the binoculars. It was Carl. The figure was unmistakable, even at that distance. Shrouded in an old Wehrmacht Macintosh, pushing his bicycle. He's made it, thought Lemus. He must have made it. He's through the document check, only currency and customs to go. Lemus watched Carl lean his bicycle against the railing and walk casually to the customs. Don't overdo it, he thought. At last, Carl came out, waved cheerfully to the man on the barrier, and the red and white pole swung slowly upwards. He was through. He was coming towards them. He had made it. Only the Vopo in the middle of the road, the white line, and safety. At that moment, Carl seemed to hear some sound, sense danger. He glanced over his shoulder, began pedaling furiously, bending low over the handlebars. There was still the lonely sentry on the bridge, and he had turned and was watching Carl. And then... Totally unexpectedly, the searchlights went on, white and brilliant, catching Carl and holding him in their beam like a rabbit in the headlights of a car. There came the seesaw wail of a siren, the sound of orders wildly shouted. In front of Lemus, two policemen dropped to their knees, peering through the sandbagged slits, deftly flicking the rapid load on their automatic rifles. The East German sentry fired, quite carefully, away from them, into his own sector. The first shot seemed to thrust Carl forward, the second to pull him back. Somehow he was still moving, still on the bicycle, passing the sentry, and the sentry was still shooting at him. And then he sagged, rolled to the ground, and they heard quite clearly the clatter of the bike as it fell. Lemus hoped to God he was dead. So, John Le Carre, you wrote this when you were serving yourself as an intelligence officer. Did you feel torn loyalties between writing about it and being faithful to a cause which ultimately does depend on secrecy? Well, um, I knew that it was um, a document that was going to paint, paint the picture very black. Um, I submitted it to my service uh, for clearance, and because they knew that it was not drawn from authentic experience, they let it through, and it's they were very decent about really, it. Wasn't it. Yeah, it wasn't my world. I, I mean, um, whatever I did there, uh, I certainly was not responsible for running East German agents and people of that kind. So I had no position there, you, but equally, it was impossible to move in diplomatic or official circles without a considerable awareness of, the, of what was going on. Um, 
and increasingly the atmosphere of betrayal was, was very oppressive um, for, for the good reason that so many traitors were being unmasked. And because of the, uh, really the increasingly uh, random way in which people were being spotted, trained, and, and, and put over the border. Um, I mean, it's a problem we're living with at the moment with Mr. Snowden. If you recruit huge numbers of people for intelligence purposes, the chances of getting a bad apple increase <laughs> exponentially. Um, but let's come back to Snowden a little later, mm, if, if mm. we may. Um, but just tell me a bit more about your fascination with the character of the spy as a type, because it does seem to drive, as well as this external mm. world that you've described about Germany uh, in the Cold War, it is the characters and their motivation that seems to really drive your interest. Well, at the end of the book, Alec Lemus, our protagonist, makes a broad statement about who spies are. Um, I don't believe there is a definition to be made um, I think we're all of us quite aware of the, the artificial sides of our lives, the moments when we pretend, the moments when we necessarily, necessarily often out of courtesy, falsify. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I spent a short time in security services here in Britain and then in overseas intelligence. And I don't look back on those people as being any different from the people in this room. Could Perhaps we all be many spies? of the people in this room have been in that world. It's, it's a very English situation. It's possible, but not so easy to spot from here. I uh, bet you everybody here has got at least an aunt or a cousin or an uncle who has done a little of this or a little of that. But is your <laughs> proposition that we could, in the right circumstances, all be spies? Or is it, as I had perhaps taken a bit from your work, particularly the earlier work, a sort of type of person who's attracted to it? Well, I, I think there's, uh, um, there are all sorts of factors at fault, at, at, at work. There are all sorts of factors at work. In this country, still, amazingly, if you bang on the door of the average householder and say, I work for British intelligence, we need to use your top floor to look out of the window, can't tell you why, most people say, once they're satisfied by your identity, okay, go upstairs. Don't mess with my daughter's room or something of like that. But we all of us instinctively incline towards the conspiratorial moment and, quite simply, the patriotic moment. We do have it. So the Brits are very easily recruited, and it goes right back to imperial times when we had the thin red line of the East India Company and so on. We had to learn to divide princes against one another, and we lived in a world of deceit. Add to that the public school system, and you have a complete conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hear a bit from another novel, from A Perfect Spy, your book about the making of a spy. If we could have something from that, please, John Shrapnel. Sir Magnus, you have in the past betrayed me, but um, more important, you have betrayed yourself. Even when you're telling the truth, you lie, you have loyalty, you have affection, but to what? To whom? I don't know all the reasons for this. Your great father, your aristocratic mother, one day maybe you'll tell me. And maybe you've put your love in some bad places now and then. He leaned forward, and there was a kindly, true affection in his face, and a warm, long-suffering smile in his eyes. Yet, you also have a morality. You search. What I'm saying is, Sir Magnus, for once nature has produced a perfect match, you are a perfect spy. All you need is a cause. I have it. I know that our revolution is young, and sometimes the wrong people are running it, in the pursuit of peace, we're making too much war. In the pursuit of freedom, we're building too many prisons. But in the long run, I don't mind, because I know this. All the junk that made you what you are, the privileges, the snobbery, the hypocrisy, the churches, the schools, the fathers, the class systems, 
the historical lies, the little lords of the countryside, the little lords of big business, all the greedy wars that result from them, we are sweeping that away forever for your sake because we are making a society that will never produce such sad little fellows as Sir Magnus. What a description of a perfect by, in part, a portrait of your father, Ronnie, who was, not to put too fine a point on it, a con man. So you grew up with disguises and pretense as part of life. Yes, yes. I mean, the character who is being addressed there is the son of the con man, uh, Magnus. And his father in the story is the con man. And, and yes, um, I, um, I think... Graham Greene said that the credit balance of the writer was his childhood, and by that standard, I am a millionaire. <laughs> um, um, my father was a, came from a, a profoundly respectable family in Bournemouth, and from very early on, uh, elected um, to, to live, uh, not to put too fine an edge on it, uh, to live a criminal life but under the guise of orthodoxy. So he did his first prison sentence when he was a very young man. Um, for, I think it was a four-year sentence. And in the middle of it, he was taken out. And I mean, this is, we're talking 1938, something like that, 37, 38, taken out and, and sentenced to uh, hard labor, another nine months. And, um, the archeology span of that escapes me. We, I don't know what that was for. Um, and from then on, he lived an extraordinarily flamboyant life. He could reinvent himself and did so, and he became a racehorse owner. He, he mixed with younger royals. He, um, he reappeared like a sort of Woody Allen character in moments of huge wealth and affluence, seeming wealth, the chauffeur-driven Bentley and all of that. Did you admire this, or did you find it embarrassing? Well, I, I don't think that I was, since I had no visible mother, um, I, I was in no position really to, to criticize, to admire, or to condemn until I became older and more pompous about it. So it was a, um, it was a fascinating childhood, and a very scary one, but it, it was a very rich one. And your spies are often down-at-heel characters, sometimes cynical, clearly morally damaged. And mm. I wonder how much that of may reflect uh, some of the background that you've just described, but I suppose a lot of intelligence officers, including at the height of the Cold War, uh, simply thought of themselves as rather principled people doing a good job on behalf of their country. Are, are you a bit hard on well, them? I, I think that is the whole point. Um, going back to the passage John read so beautifully just now, um, what do you love, Magnus? What do you love? And for many people who've failed, perhaps, to, to give themselves in love or failed to receive love, institutions require, acquire, institutions acquire enormous importance. And they espouse the service, and they espouse their countries full-heartedly. And they put their love in that direction. And I think it's a kind of substitute, quite often, for repressed people. Um, to, to invest their love in the service. Uh, um, so it doesn't seem to me, I mean, the service itself, after all, is looking for people with a streak of larceny in them. You only have to read the rather illiterate ads that occasionally appear in The Guardian inviting you to apply to the secret services, or whatever it is, or three people in the room, you have to, you've got 20 minutes to persuade them to your point of view, i.e., can you find a traitor in the room? this stuff. I mean, it's very difficult when, when spies go astray. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you next. Mm. I mean, a spy who, of course, went spectacularly uh, astray with devastating consequences was Kim Philby. Mm. You were an intelligence officer in the service at the time when Philby was running amok and giving away the identity of agents to Moscow. Uh, what, the impact of that must have been immense. Uh, far, far greater than was ever admitted. And uh, Burgess and McLean also enormous. And uh, the problem, and the difference very interestingly between the Brits and the Americans is that our traitors were ideologues, flawed ideologues of a sort. They never did it for money. 
the American traitors, who are quite as numerous, if not more so, have almost exclusively done it for material reasons or out of anger. Um, but uh, yes, huge damage, I, I think. and George Blake, enormous damage. Was Philby aware of you as an officer, and do you feel that you might have been on well, Philby's list? Um, it's a reasonable assumption. Uh, in those days, the service was much smaller. Both services were much, much smaller and quite differently constituted. They were, they were um, little tiny mini structures of British society, but the weight was at the top. And uh, so when somebody was a candidate for, for recruitment for the service, his name was passed around. And uh, so it's perfectly possible, and indeed, from what one knows of what Philby delivered to his Russian masters, more than possible that my name as a candidate even was betrayed to what was at the NKVD and later the KGB, um, as were the names of numberless other people, m much more particularly agents in the field. Let us, on that th the major theme of betrayal, which also stalked your work, go to the audience for some questions, if we could. Um, please put up your hands. Um, you mentioned that your childhood was rather scary, and I wondered if you'd like to comment on how uh, you use and probably develop this aspect in your writing. I didn't get that. Um, your childhood, yes. the lady asked, was rather scary in some regards. Yes. How you used and developed that in your writing? Well, um, home was a very dangerous place, uh, as it was for George Smiley, uh, as it is for most of my, my protagonists in that world. Um, homes where you can be found, homes where they come and arrest you, homes where the bailiffs come and turf out your toys and your clothes. So there was great tension in the object of home, and that was already a reason for never feeling safe. Insecurity is a wonderful spark for writing. And then there was the irrational nature of our lives. We never knew whether we, which house we were going to be in in the holiday, we never knew whether we were going to go to holiday school or to our grandparents. So life was constantly erratic and therefore very stimulating. And it drove me in on myself. And since my father's life was one of fantasy, he was a superb con man, build castles in the air, invent characters for you, anything. Since that gift was already an example to me, it was a natural thing to flow into writing fiction. I wondered, perhaps we might get a reading now which gives us a sense of the moral conundrum at the heart of the spy who came in from the cold, and we might then have a word about that. John Shrapnel. How can you turn the world upside down, Liz shouted suddenly. Fiedler was kind and decent. He was only doing his job, and now you've killed him. Munt is a spy and a traitor, and you protected him. Munt is a Nazi. You know that? He hates Jews. And what side are you on? How can you? There's only one law in this game, Lemus retorted. Munt is their man. He gives them what they need. That's easy enough to understand, isn't it? Leninism. The expediency of temporary alliances. I mean, what do you think spies are? Hmm? Priests? Saints? and martyrs. They're a squalid procession of vain fools. Traitors, too, yes. Pansies, sadists, and drunkards. People who play cowboys and Indians to brighten their rotten lives. <laughs> Do you think they sit like monks in London, balancing the rights and wrongs? I'd have killed Munt if I could. I hate his guts. But not now. It so happens that they need him. They need him so that the great moronic mass that you admire can sleep soundly in their beds at night. They need him for the safety of ordinary, crummy people like you and me. But, but what about Fiedler? Don't you feel anything for him? This is war, Lemus replied. It's graphic and unpleasant because it's fought on a tiny scale at close range. Fought with a wastage of innocent life sometimes, I admit. But it's nothing 
nothing at all beside other wars, the last or the next. The Spy Who Came In From The Cold is, is an angry book. Uh, everyone is unhappy, except the truly amoral people on either side. And yet the conclusion is that it could be worse, that war is worse than the Cold War. I'm, I'm not sure that it couldn't have been worse. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think I felt at the time, as I feel now in a different context, that communism was terrible in its effect. It fell into the wrong hands. But second to that, anti-communism became a real pain. It became a false justification for doing a whole lot of things. Um, just, for example, for dispossessing uh, Iran of Mossadegh, installing the Shah, for confusing uh, um, an urge towards uh, independence with, um, with uh, infidelity towards the Western cause. And uh, again and again in our Cold War history, we've leapt into places where we had no business on the grounds that if we didn't leap, they would become communist. And we're paying for that now. In the Middle East, unbelievably so. Um, going back to the question of expediency, and today's enemies are tomorrow's friends and vice versa, I think we've seen in recent times, without the benefit of a Cold War, how absolutely injudicious many of our false alliances have been. If you look at uh, our espousal of the of uh, Gaddafi's spy master, uh, which is yet to be examined, and probably never will be examined anyway, in, in public. Maybe there's a book um, in it. Again and again, we have cynically espoused, particularly in the Middle East, secular forces, because we believe that their tyranny is better than giving um, independence or freedom to the nation. Well, let's fast forward now at that very mm. useful point through the Cold War, its end and its aftermath uh, to 9-11, and we come bang up to dating in your writing with a delicate truth, your latest novel, mm. which paints a very critical picture of the spying game and the new moral challenges of the secret state today. Uh, let's have a flavor of it. Here, a former senior civil servant is trying to alert the authorities to the bad behavior of a private security contractor whose covert operation, codenamed Wildlife, has gone badly wrong. We have a new set of rules since your day for cases where sensitive issues are involved, some already in place and others we trust imminent. And um, very unfortunately, wildlife does tick a lot of those boxes, which would mean, I'm afraid, that any inquiry would take place behind closed doors. And uh, should it find against you, and should you elect to bring a suit, which would naturally be your good right, then the resulting hearing would be conducted by a hand-picked and very carefully briefed group of approved lawyers, some of whom would obviously do their best to speak for you, and others not so for you. And you, the, uh, the claimant, as he or she is rather whimsically called, would, I'm afraid, be banished from the court while the government presented its case to the judge without the inconvenience of a direct challenge by you or your representative. And um, under the rules currently being discussed, the very fact that a hearing is being conducted might of itself be kept secret, as, of course, in that case, would the judgment. After a rueful smile to harbinger a further spot of bad news and a, a pat for his hair, he resumed. And then, as Francis so rightly says, if there were ever a criminal case against you, any prosecution would take place in total secrecy until a sentence was handed down, which is to say, I'm afraid, Kit, allowing himself another sympathetic smile, though whether for the law or its victim was unclear, draconian though it may sound, Susanna, wouldn't necessarily know you were on trial, assuming for a moment that you were, or at least not until you'd been found guilty, assuming once more that you had been. What do you make, John, of current responses to the rise of violent Islamic extremism and the opportunity 
that it gives secret services to lobby governments for exceptions to general constitutional practice in the West, like the secret courts? Well, I think I said above um, anti-communism that it became an excuse for doing all sorts of dreadful things. Uh, invading countries where we had no right to be, installing dictators who should not have been ruling, um, subverting decent governments because they didn't suit us. I think that there is a great danger, and I suspect we all of it feel, feel that in this room, that anti-terror is becoming a catch-all for all sorts of draconian things that suit the government, suit the administration, but actually limit our personal freedom in a most dangerous way. Well, you say that we all feel it, but clearly not everybody does, and some people do feel that the, the threat does justify states taking extraordinary measures. I mean, Ken Clark, who you're hardly the most rapacious on pro-American yeah. minister, just to finish the point, you know, mm. he has defended the secret court's proposal, saying this is sometimes the only practical means of delivering justice where otherwise there would be none. Well, that's his view. I don't share it. Um, I think there's quite enough legislation in place for secret, uh, for parts of a trial to be held in secret. That's been going on for years and years. I don't think we need to bow, in this case, to American pressure. The whole issue is how quickly can we enact legislation to prevent information reaching the public about American methods of interrogation during the worst Bush years. And that's so embarrassing and the relationship between the two intelligence services is so close that we can't let that happen. That is the perception of the government. The so rush to legislation. The suggestion in the book is that the relationship between the Foreign Office and the sort of formal face of the British state abroad mm. and the security services got far too close. They're too much in cahoots. Do you think that really that that has got worse at the moment? Yes, I do. I'll tell you why. Um, Let's take the United States for a moment. Um, it's now estimated that in the District of Columbia alone, nearly a million people who are non-governmental are cleared for secret and top secret work associations. There is a circle of insiders growing and growing and growing. But what about in this country? In this country, it's absolutely the same. The intelligence community is getting too big for its boots. So we have a situation in the run-up to the Iraq war where one person says to another in the corridor of the House of Commons, if you had seen the papers I saw, you would know how to vote. And that ran like wildfire through members of parliament. Perfectly understandably, they were frightened, they thought they had to do their duty by the country, even though they did not know what was going on. We now know that the documents they were working from were wrong, that the portrait of Saddam's threat was completely inaccurate. But and, that isn't the same and, as and saying that that, that was known that at the time. That is the power. And I say to you, Anne, if I do, I take you aside and say, I've seen the papers, I've spoken to the chaps and the girls, and I can tell you, you've got to vote this way. But if the chaps and the girls think they've got it right, how should people rationally well, respond? If the chaps and the girls think they've got it right, we go to war in Iraq. That's the problem. <laughs> But here we are in a, a messy, multipolar, or perhaps even a non-polar world compared with the mm -hmm. balance of moral questions in the bipolar world that you described earlier in your writing career. It's very easy to say what the wrong thing to do is. Is the right thing to do clear in your mind? I'm sure we've done the right thing in all sorts of different ways. I think we did the right thing by the Irish threat. By the, um, we took the hits. We conducted whatever trials were necessary. Some of them we know now in retrospect were unjust, what people were unfairly tried. But we didn't panic. Even when our prime minister was nearly blown to pieces in Brighton, we didn't panic. But now we succumb to an international fever of anxiety, which I think is very dangerous, and I think it's exaggerated. And you don't believe that the threat being a global threat which moves around the world, we see it in many places, not just a problem in our own society, I think it's very is, possible is such to, that you have to make a, a different qualitative response? I, I think it's very possible. We're watching the process now. It's very possible to invent the enemy and make him real. I think there were all sorts of, 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 of great wells of anger which are now expressing themselves. Um, but in the past left to ourselves, we have found a path of moderation. We did, uh, we did manage to 
secede power in our colonies and things like that. Why do you think, now on your see, view, why do you think now pol politicians see, are so reluctant to follow your logic, whether well, they're Labour or Conservative, not a big difference on security? First of all, foreign policy is not a voting issue in, um, in, in, the, public, in, in, in the general public at all. And, and secondly, the, the pressure, the black and white pressure, if you like, if you're not with us, you're against us, is so overwhelming for the average foot soldier in Parliament, so daunting, and the, the omnipresence of the intelligence imperative so powerful that it's very hard to have an existence as a single politician. But David Cameron or William Hague, they're not average foot soldiers. I'm not going to comment on our Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> there is a phrase which hits the head. Sorry. There is a phrase which hits the nail on the head in your latest novel, A Delicate Truth. The most feared creature of our contemporary world, the solitary decider. This is someone who is a keeper of secrets and decides to tell all. Vivid cases have been in the news, and one that you couldn't have known about, of course, when you wrote it, Edward Snowden. How do you judge Edward Snowden and the moral conundrum of what he's done? Well, I guess, first of all, I wish that Obama had had abrogated the Espionage Act so that he wouldn't be in this bind. The thing is that there is not a decent democracy in the world that doesn't need whistleblowers. We all know that. We all know they produce their, their necessary function. The problem comes when this particular whistleblower comes out of the intelligence corporate establishment. And hugely embarrasses corporations that have been promising us privacy. Um, they suddenly find they've got their pants around their ankles. And, uh, and hugely embarrasses the American government. Uh, how do you feel I, what, about him? What, do you feel how do he's I done feel about him myself? I, th I think that, um, I mean, we, there are whistleblowers like Daniel Ellsberg, who blew the whistle on the Pentagon Papers, who are now national heroes. We've had a few whistleblowers here who've got off scot-free, who've emerged from MI5, for instance, reported that MI5 was spying on the unions, if you remember so that one. Should Snowden get off scot-free? But I think, generally speaking, if you're a whistleblower, you go in with your eyes wide open, and you know that you're going to have to take the rap. You may get away with it, but it's unlikely. What I do find extraordinary is that when Snowden elected to take this course, that he decided to go to Hong Kong, that the people to whom he was uh, blowing his whistle, in this case, the Guardian newspaper, uh, did not take him on as one would normally an informant and look after his welfare later. I don't know whether they discussed that with him. I don't know um, you think what that measures they took. The Guardian took, is culpable I mean, for not doing that. Well, if I were running a newspaper and somebody came to me and he said, I want to give you the crown jewels on American uh, eavesdropping espionage and so on, uh, I would say, well, what happens when we've blown the whistle? What's going to become of you? I don't want to see you hanging from the gallows. Um, I don't it, understand it, what it, happened. It doesn't I don't seem to be about to be was. hanging from the gallows, but there's clearly a rather difficult situation in which he ends up uh, either mm. talking to the Chinese, saying things in Moscow which can be, at least, or being understood in America as endangering their national security. So well, isn't, he not, bit, isn't he a bit of a mm. mixed blessing? I'm not condoning what he's done. Um, I, I would imagine that in the United States it's, it absolutely conflicts with the Bill of Rights, if not, if not the American Constitution, um, the stuff that he's revealed. But uh, I, 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 if, you, if, you, if you elect to become um, a whistleblower, then um, either you say you're going to face the music, which is what he said initially, um, or you find somewhere safe to go and live. I don't understand. I just don't get the Hong Kong element, now the Moscow element. But can I just clarify one thing? You said you didn't condone it, but on the whole, in terms of unveiling aspects of the Secret Services that you clearly have great doubts about, do you on the whole think he is more beneficial or more of a liability to global security? I think that um, I have to say I'm not being evasive. I simply don't know, and I don't know for this reason. On the one hand, we're being told that what he's revealed is actually general knowledge anyway. And on the other hand, we're being told that he's going to be, he is wanted for treason and God knows what. I don't know, in fact, the extent of the damage. 
and I don't know how necessary it was for him to have blown the whistle. Um, and therefore, I, I have to be woolly about it. I thought you might find some irony in him ending up in Moscow in the good old Cold War way. In, 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 the, in the transit area of Sheremetyevo Airport. Um, it's, it's quite extraordinary, and, and uh, he seems to have made an awful muddle. Right, let's have some questions, demuddling questions. Oh, uh, yes, we have. What have we got? Uh, who's nearest? The gentleman in the front with the sunglasses, I think. I think. Hello, yes, name is uh, Mark Locke here. Uh, just going back to Snowden, um, I wonder what uh, Mr. Lacari would think uh, regarding Snowden's employment, because as I understand it, he's, um, he's actually a subcontractor. He's, he's, he didn't work directly for the American government. And I wonder how you think that um, is bode for the future in, uh, in spying. <laughs> well, subcontractors and the role of uh, uh, Snowden as at least in part a subcontractor to the intelligence services, this actually plays quite a role in your book, isn't it? The numbers yes. of people who don't work directly yes. for an agency in the way that in your day you worked for an intelligence service. Well, yeah, we're, we're, um I mean, it is a profoundly disturbing situation, particularly in the United States, I think, but it's happening here too. Mussolini, I think, made, made the fatal observation that when corporate power and government power were indistinguishable, then you had a fascist state. And I'm not suggesting that we've reached that stage, but we are progressing more and more with the delegation of power to, to, uh, um, to corporate entities, the outsourcing of collecting information, and, and indeed this whole technological outsourcing, uh, does produce a different kind of military-industrial complex, which I find very disturbing. And I don't know how, where you put, I don't know where you stop it. I mean, uh, um, if somebody manufactures drones, then they're also going to deliver the people who can operate them. And so it goes on. That, that is the industrial necessity. Um, so I, I know no answer to that, but part of my job, as I see it, part of my, uh, um, yeah, my usefulness is to ask questions that I can't necessarily answer, but just to disturb a bit. Anything from this side of the room? Any other questions? Anyone on this side or any other hands? I've got a hand over there, a gentleman with spectacles in the end of a row, very conveniently. Thank you. My name is John, and I'm just thinking about 50 years ago and now. Would you like to comment on where you think power really lies? Because I think that our institutions have become somehow debased, and there's such apathy about parliament and voting and all the rest of it. I don't think the real power lies in the government at all. Does real power still lie meaningfully with government and institutions, or has power become debased? Um, it seems less and less to be the real source of power. Uh, um, as I, I, I think the question, in a sense, answers itself. I, um, I, I think there are times when government just seems, when, uh, when formal government appears just cosmetic um, and is, is, is simply being molded and directed by massive corporate power. There is a great German word, and you're an excellent German speaker, so you know it, and it's Alterszorn, the rage of age, of getting old. Mm. Is there a danger that anger about the state of the world tips over into polemic, and are you ever guilty of that? Well, uh, if it's Alterszorn, um, I, I was definitely prematurely old. <laughs> 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 Um, but <clears throat> I don't think I've changed at all. Just different no. targets. And something that interested me just reading back over your work of 50 years, quite an extraordinary different portrait of, of England that emerges from that, never mind the wider world and the, mm. the daring do. This is a kind of study of an Englishman who you've been making for many years now. I mean, what have you learned about the, the changing nature of England and Englishmen? Well, I've learned it through my children and my grandchildren, I suppose. Um, Is it a very we're we're educated country? by them. Is it a different country? It's a different country. To a point, I think the most vexatious thing is how little different it is in so many ways. Um, 
when I ran away from my public school, uh, um, I was being told that I was the last generation. That was in 1945, 46, and it was the Attlee government. And we were only going to have one kind of school in Britain, It'd be like other countries. Um, I used to imagine that uh, we would have no monarchy, that with the class system would disappear, uh, that there would be somehow a greater coming together of ordinary people. And actually, uh, looking back, I never saw that happen. And somehow or another, in our own strange British way, we've kept the old order intact and just look at the constitution of our cabinet. I mean, when I was teaching at Eton, we had, I think, 12 or 13 members of the cabinet who were Old Etonians. And I thought, this can never happen again. Now we have an Old Etonian London mayor, we have an Old Etonian prime minister, and they're scattered across the cabinet just as they used to be. Is that something that amuses you? You look rather wry when you say that, or do you think that it's wrong? I think it's wrong to allow that structure to remain and then boast about equality of opportunity. That's ridiculous. In, in schools where, I mean, in countries where you and I have lived, different countries, the issue of where you go to school was solved for you. If you were born in Heidelberg, you went to the local school in Heidelberg, and that was that. And at least you rubbed shoulders with people from other income groups, other classes, other sorts of people. Are you suggesting abolition of private schools would be a good thing for the country? Um, I think a sober abolition, a sober integration of the educational system would be socially useful. I think it would make us all much happier. And these poor people who are on the edge of being able to afford private education and then drain themselves of their money so that they can send their children to better schools and so on wouldn't have that agony. I mean, I'm sorry for those people too. Uh, it isn't a socialistic perception. It's a simple humanitarian one. Incidentally, Michael Gove, in some piece, wrote recently that I was a lefty. Did you know that? I never, I jolly nearly sued him. <laughs> I, I, right here. Mr. Gove, if you are listening, what would you like to be described as if not a lefty? I would like to be described as a crossbencher, a free thinker of the old sort. I suppose I'm, I, I sometimes favor favor the, uh, the liberal element in the Conservative Party. I'm, I'm an absolute, um, I hop from bench to bench, and I take case by case in life. I, I, um, it, it isn't that I have some doctrinaire position I'm trying to illustrate. It's, it's trying to see things in a wide-eyed way and turn them into fable. And of course, you have a, a very long lens on the left and the right. When you look back at the spy who came in from the cold 50 years on, what do you see? Uh, I see a very immature fellow uh, caught in the crosshairs of his own life um, with great marital difficulties, great anxiety, and being rushed to Berlin when the wall started going up. And then in a kind of mute frenzy, uh, watching the first bits of barbed wire in the Friedrichstrasse and so on, and then shooting back and in five weeks, writing a book that was really the expression of a life crisis um, and also of some kind of internal political eruption. Is it like seeing an old friend again after so long? I, I can never read my own books. I, I wouldn't recommend them at all. <laughs> <laughs> there you are, yes. What, what a ringing endorsement from the author himself. Well, then we must leave the secret ways of the world. My thanks to John Le Carre for his insights and to our reader, John Shrapnel.